Hi, everyone. Welcome to our event, Utopian Cycles and Archive Practices, Past, Present, and Future Histories. Really excited to see a lot of people from like the data schools yesterday, as well as just like many more. And I think you guys are going to be really intrigued in the story that we have to tell today. So just to give a brief um, event synopsis, this is the public keynote for the online cultural heritage data school. And of course, we always like to begin with just acknowledgements and thanks. So we thank CDH, Irving, Karen, um, and you know people all the way from Mexico City to Colombia who have joined specifically for this talk. Um, you know, as Irving just mentioned, we really want to prioritize an interactive um, conversation by presenting initiatives or things that are going on already combating the erasure that occurs within, you know, cultural dances and practices. Um, the recovery of preservation of Black and Asian histories um, is going to, of course, be like the main point that we focus on. Um, and of course, you know, the cyclical nature of past, present, and future. Okay, to give a bio for all the amazing speakers here, Mama Sila is an award-winning writer and lecturer, originally from Kenya. During her career, she has worked across theater, film, radio, and a range of other artistic activities. She was a member of British, British Actors' Equity, the Writers' Guild of Great Britain, and the Performing Rights Society, and has written several plays, including The Single Parent, which was the winner of GLC Film Script Award, and Emissary Rights, winner of 1991 Barclays New Stages Award, which was also adopted into the first African opera in Europe. She has also worked as a lecturer in creative writing and well-being at Hastings College and Rye College, and as a writer in residence at the Delaware Pavilion Theatre. She is an active community leader, campaigner, and activist in matters related to racism, mental health, arts, and the culture. Alda Terriciano is an academic researcher, visual artist, curator, and activist who has worked with diverse communities in Britain, and in 2001, she co-founded Future Histories, the first independent archive of African, Asian, and Caribbean performing arts in the UK, based at Goldsmiths University, for which she curated groundbreaking, cataloging, and digitization projects and exhibitions. She is also the artistic director of Aldeterra Projects and honorary research, senior research fellow at UCL. Jendai Omawale is a Caribbean American filmmaker and writer focused on telling the narratives of those marginalized in the historical archive. She has worked for over four years as a journalist and collaborated with various platforms such as Impact and Environment. She has an, an MPhil in world history from Cambridge University. And with her dissertation, she looked at the role of Kittitian and Nevisian plantation societies in the political and legislative policies of the transatlantic slave trade. Adilmian are a first-generation British Pakistani Muslim. Their current practices focus on environmental disaster mitigation in Pakistan, particularly developing ethical tools for flood mitigation through collaboration with Cambridge University. Sarah Sershar is a practicing immersive artist and activist while actively being involved in game design. She is also the founder of Euphoria, a platform attempting to uncover non-knowledge through creating digitized archives of the inner experience, greatly associated with unknowable and unutterable histories of violence. So those are all the speakers for today. And we're going to begin now with the first of the tribal murid of the sections, which is the past, being led by Alda and Mamasila. Africans communicated through oral storytelling, music, dance, artwork, carvings on wood, on stone, and walls of caves, beads, tattoos, and colors. They would use symbols. They would use symbols, riddles, proverbs, metaphors to pass their messages and stories through the younger generation who in return would repeat the process. In this way, this was their way of archiving and preserving their history. My circumstances experiences in rural Kenya in the 1940s and 1950s led me to observe and listen to mythological stories from the elders. 
Then from 1960s, when I moved to Europe, I found myself observing, experiencing, and listening to contemporary women who at times had experienced violence. All this has influenced my technique of script writing as well as my reading, including the book In the Vision by Wusa Masuri Credo Mutua. Now I would like to share with you other ways of transmitting knowledge and history through some of the African symbols. As you can see, there are two, a number two, which shows two, and then tribes, and then Guni. These are two tribes of South Africa. So anybody could have seen they were actually tribes. Then you, the following one says Mambo West. And this you can see there are spies communicating if whatever was happening in the two tribes. Then there are two leaders who didn't want to have war and they wanted to make peace. So they made peace. And then they made uh, you know, they had a congregation and they had great peace out of respect. And they wanted to do that for the future generation because there was a lot of death, you know, you can see they showed how they buried their people and they could dig it, um, they could dig, you know, the grave on the ground. And what they didn't want to do is to have, you know, to repeat the wars of yesterday. So that was really how they made their story. So by just looking at these few um, symbols from Credo Motua's book, we can make a complete story. You can see there were thousands and thousands of them having that meeting. And it, this had been going maybe for years. So that's the way the storytelling without even writing a script, you can tell the story from the symbols. To better explain the process of script writing and mythological stories, I would also like to share with you an extract from my play, The Raging Goddesses, saved by the Future History Archives. Based on African mythological goddesses and legends, African goddesses in foreign land have been subjected to violence and the violation of womanhood. Seven goddesses met at the high place of justice in the native land. At the summit of a hill, which is a holy sanctuary through rituals and the ceremonies, they reflect and share their stories, experiences, then they purify and empower themselves. Some have a triumph rebirth as warriors, as survivors, as women of substance, and as mothers. Others are not so successful, but they take on their life's journey, each following one's own path, each coping with the tribulation in foreign land. These goddesses are mirrors of our modern lives. Ma Mombi. She's the central character, the first mother goddess who has been on her own journey. She's more, the modern therapist, the healer, the officiator of rituals and ceremonies. 
Mamumbi. We welcome you, my daughter. Tell us your story. But there's an animal, a young bride. One beautiful day, two summers ago, my husband and I were enjoying our nuptial bliss in the common. Suddenly, I had premonition of danger and I urged my husband, we should go home. But, but my Lord husband, like all African men, was stubborn. Suddenly, I had a grant from my husband, and then a heavy blow on top of my head, and I staggered to the ground. As I was losing consciousness, a dark tunnel opened in front of me, and I crawled along towards the light. Ugly, wicked creatures were dangling from the ceilings, laughing at me. I closed my eyes and walked blindly, but I could hear their heavy breathing, grunting as they were, as they were touching me all over. I was fighting them until I reached the entrance of the cave. As I was getting out, I opened my eyes. Why? The most terrifying green eyes of a strange man on top of me was staring at me. The strange one had pink skin and his hair was like the mane of a lion. God of light, I was filled with terror. Those green eyes seemed to see right through into my soul and made me feel naked and inhuman. I was about to scream, to scream when the stranger put his hand on my mouth while the other hand was tearing off my clothes. I tried to push him away, but he was like a hungry hyena, and he took me. He took me. The challenges encountered by playwrights of African descent archiving and preserving their material in the UK for the future generations access back in the days were insurmountable. Although I was a member of the Writers Guild of Great Britain, the advice I was given was to post a copy of my manuscript addressed to me and store them. And that's what I did. It was about copyright, not preservation. There were other challenges to facing African playwrights. After lengthy campaigns and fights for minority artists to have representation, we managed to have the Afro-Asian Artist Register in 1984 and a second edition in 1986. When we became vocally strong, we were split up and we became Afro-Caribbean. Once more, we were split and the focus was on the Caribbean <laughs> because they had English names. It became difficult to progress in anything if you had an African name, unless you change your name. But then in 1993, I was doing major repairs to my home and I had to clear the whole apartment. I stored everything in a warehouse in Nottingham and an arsonist is set in the fire, uh, set fire to the to the warehouse. I lost everything, including my man's my, my man's kids. This incident and others 
incident which followed traumatized me so much that I stopped writing and got in, involved in other activities in order to heal. In 2006, I did a research course at the University of Brighton and I started researching the internet. To my surprise, I found drafts of some of my work mentioned in the British National Archives and the music composer of my opera, Emissary Rights and the Raging Goddesses, he had archived my work. Now the challenges were how to get the copies of my work. It took some years for my family, my friends, and I to finally get in touch with the future histories archives and Dr. Alda Terashiano. It has taken years and I still have not been able to get the copies of my work scattered on the internet, apart from those archived by future histories. Thank you, Mama Sila. Um, I just want to say we are so lucky to have you and your work with us still. And every time we hear the story, it is such a beautiful com commitment to the legacy of your work and how it can survive in very unusual ways. Um, we'll head on to Alda Terashiana, and she has some really exciting stuff um, with respect to future histories. So first of all, thank you, Mama Sila. Um, it has been uh, a real honor to meet you. Um, uh, this is about a couple of months ago uh, when uh, you got in touch um, with the Goldsmiths University where the Future Histories Archives are held and via Goldsmiths University to us. And then obviously we granted the permission for you to access your own material and uh, make copies of your scripts, the ones that we had kept in the archive. And since then, um, it has been um, a, a real pleasure um, to have conversations with you and further explore together the issues that um, um, writers and artists of your generations um, have faced um, in obviously producing, but also preserving uh, the history of um, Black and Asian theater in the UK. So, um, to just to tell you a little bit about future histories, um, this is the uh, homepage of our website, uh, which we um, relaunched um, a couple of years ago. And Future Histories is a cultural heritage organization and an independent archive, as um, Adil um, has already said. Um, in 2001, uh, I co-founded the organization with Amina McConnell, who at the time was the uh, coordinator of the Black Theatre Forum, as well as artists, um, members of the forum, uh, including Jennifer Bernard, who's, uh, I think, um, in the audience tonight, and uh, academics and we basically um, at the time were uh, trying to find a, a house um, which would be safer <laughs> than the warehouse where unfortunately Mama Sila um, um, uh, stored her material but um, basically a heritage organization or um, um, uh, a, a university that could provide um, a safe storage for the Black Theatre Forum archive, which at the time um, was going through uh, financial difficulties as the Arts Council had closed, um, had, had, had basically um, uh, pulled out the funding and the office had closed. So uh, why am I telling you this? Because this is a story which back in um, the 90s uh, was pretty common, um, organizations, theater organizations, dance organizations, which could not sustain uh, their activities any longer, didn't really have um, so much um, of um, the, uh, you know, uh, the support that other organizations might have had uh, with mainstream institutions. And so, 
the idea at the time uh, for us uh, co-founders of future histories and the board members was to try to find uh, a way for these uh, theater groups and dance groups uh, to be able to um, safely deposit their material with us on loan so that then we could negotiate uh, arrangements um, with institutions and develop uh, cataloging projects, uh, digitization projects and providing access to this material. So we established an initial uh, collaboration with, uh, no, 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 let's, let's stay back uh, with the same, um, yes. So in uh, 2001, we established um, a collaboration with uh, Middlesex University, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Lola Young. Um, and the idea at the time was also to develop uh, the basis for uh, a national uh, research center on Black and Asian theater. Uh, um, and then in 2002, we uh, received the first funding from the um, Heritage Rotary Fund to deliver the Remembering Black Performance Project, which was going to catalog and make accessible the Black Theatre Forum and the Nitro Theatre Company Archive, which was um, basically uh, previously known as Black Theatre Cooperative. Now, these activities were done in collaboration with the national archives and at the time our priority was to make sure that these catalogs could be visible and could be accessible digitally um, via a mainstream heritage institution because people um, up to that point had no access to online catalogs of uh, Black and Asian performance, apart from material held at the VNA Theatre Museum, which was not digitally accessible. Um, so as we started developing this project, we also realized that the work of the archive could not just stay with cataloging and digitizing for what was possible, but had to involve also lobbying for the sector and so in consultation uh, with a number of specialists we uh, started um, uh, participating to the activities for example of uh, the london mayor's commission on african and asian heritage which in 2003 um, uh, gave uh, an enormous uh, impetus uh, really to the preservation of uh, black and asian histories in the uk um, focusing on London, but obviously looking at the wider spectrum in the UK. Uh, we also um, uh, participated to conferences, advisory boards, meetings in various um, heritage institutions, because the objective was very much to counteract the state of invisibility of the sector and promote its inclusion in mainstream uh, heritage. Now, this uh, invisibility had actually had a significant impact also on academic research and academic studies because these resources, the primary resources not being available, had not obviously been, um, you know, consulted by uh, academics who could not obviously do research. And I knew this firsthand because I was carrying out at the time my PhD on Black and Asian uh, theater history in uh, England. And um, and so uh, those unsurmountable difficulties that uh, Mama Sila mentioned earlier were also the difficulties that I had encountered in accessing uh, primary resources, and 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 so there was, in a sense, at the basis of future histories at the time, a shared commitment uh, towards global majority theater artists to really make sure that these histories would be preserved for the present as well as the future because at the present at that present we still um, lacked the voice um, of uh, uh, black and asian artists contribution to the theater scene in critical discourses and academic discourses um, so when when we were looking for inspiration in terms of what kind of um, ethos we would um, 
uh, we would want for the organization, we also started looking at, uh, at the history that the Black Theatre Forum archive contained. And in fact, the name Future Histories comes from a seminal conference which was produced in 1995 by the forum called Future Histories, which brought to London 250 delegates uh, from various parts in the UK to discuss the future of Black theatre in, in the UK and also the preservation of its living heritage and archives. And so this seminal um, uh, conference um, was really, in a sense, the basis of our activities and how we decided then to uh, move forward with uh, the projects that followed. Um, and, 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 and so, in a sense, this was the basis also of the kind of critical engagement which I had with the material uh, in terms of then starting to think about forms of um participation that would not just be around consultation but would very much be around the co-design of these uh digital resources that we were committed to create uh co-design in terms of what to select for these resources, how to present them, what language to use, what kind of descriptions. And so in this process, artists, activists, young people studying at university, uh, historians, journalists, they were all involved in the process of um, revealing uh, the histories uh, contained in these archives. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, following the delivery of two other significant projects, then in 2006, we started working towards uh, a major um, uh, a project funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and running collaboration with the VNA, the natural the, the uh, National Archives and Talawa Theatre Company. Uh, and uh, the project was called the Trading Faces Recollecting Slavery. Uh, it was developed between 2006 and 2007 when uh, Britain had a series of commemorations to mark the uh, 200 year anniversary of the parliamentary abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, at that time, a significant number of projects and public events was um, funded. Um, and what for us was important, though, was to go beyond the commemoration of that event and try to use that event to highlight the enormous contribution that over those 200 years, people of African descent had uh, contributed uh, to uh, in terms of the history, um, but also the practices and aesthetics of uh, theatre in the UK. And so for us, this project was an opportunity for sharing resources already available and also making visible those resources uh, at the VNA as well as the Talao archive and the archives that we already held uh, a future histories. Now, the curatorial approach uh, to this online exhibition, uh, the, 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 the project included a number of activities. I won't go into that. I will focus on the um, uh, online exhibition, uh, Trading Faces, uh, which I co-curated with, as I said, artists, uh, members of the public, young people, historians. And um, here with this exhibition, we really started to grapple with, uh, you know, the challenges of exhibiting the intangible heritage of Black performance, which is, um, you know, true to uh, performance histories in general, um, because obviously, uh, performance is hinged uh, on the moment, uh, is deeply bound to its audiences and the memories of these um, events. And so, in a sense, 
performance is as transient as the variety of people that produce and witness uh, their enactment. And so what was really important for us was to kind of try to find a way to explore these arch archival documents as traces of what might have happened in the past rather than, um, you know, uh, records that would fix that past. Um, and, and, and equally important was the discussions, the conversations, the process of communities uh, of reconstructing such events uh, by engaging um, through, uh, you know, uh, focus groups, um, conversations, uh, meetings, uh, shared activities, so that the plurality of subjects could also be reflected, um, you know, in, 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 in the final product. Now, um, a very important element in the uh, building of um, this exhibition, which remains, uh, to my knowledge, the only resource on the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade in British performing arts online, um, was to work with artists of African descent to critically engage with the issue of invisibility that had characterized the sector for the decades and, and so, uh, you know, engage with this shared responsibility that we felt at Future Histories for providing and promoting wider access uh, to historical records. So, um, just to just so to wrap up, um, what I what I would say is that for us. What remains still critical is, you know, what ways are the best ways to actually uh, preserve, disseminate, and critically engage with material when we deal with a digital uh, context where everything is in constant flux. Now, what I would like to do um, following this introduction is to share with you uh, three extracts from a play. And if we go, uh, can go back, uh, Adele, if we can go forward to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, a production uh, which uh, was um, basically pr produced by the Black Theatre Cooperative in 1995. And the play um, called Zumbi uh, spotlights the um, uh, uh, main uh, character uh, of Zumbi, who was an enslaved African in Brazil, uh, killed by the Portuguese in 1695 for defending his village and uh, the, the attempt to uh, build uh, a commune uh, of uh, people of African descent uh, outside of uh, slavery. And uh, so the, the, the story is a very interesting story because it takes place in modern times and exposes the unchanged conditions that um, Black people uh, experience internationally, interweaving uh, the history of rebellion, of Zumbi, with a series of narratives um, that had been uh, basically collected through oral history uh, sessions by the artists in Nigeria, Ghana, Jamaica, and Britain. Um, this was uh, a, an international collaboration with Marcia Marais, um, uh, a, a director in Brazil, who uh, came over to the UK and so shows this um, international, um, if you like, um, value uh, of uh, sharing stories uh, across the board and across, obviously, the Atlantic and beyond. Um, it was produced, um, uh, presented, uh, produced and then presented at the Theatre Royal Stratford East and then went on a UK tour. Now, Future Histories contains uh, a substantial amount of VH, VHS tapes uh, of performances. When we 
first um, cataloged the material uh, and started digitizing some of the material from the archive, we could not afford with the funding available to us to digitize VHS tapes. And so uh, what you are going to see tonight is um, an extract from the original recording um, without any kind of editing uh, or any uh, enhancement in terms of sound or anything, but it, it will offer us a platform for discussion on what happens uh, if we decide to then um, fundraise as we should for preservation and dissemination? So, uh, Adil, would you please um, start sharing the video? So what I could do, I could just uh, give, say here, so in this part, what we have is um, an original narration of uh, what happened to the 2000 um, um, enslaved people once they were uh, then uh, caught and brought back um, to the plantation. Here we have a contemporary story um, where this, um, uh, legacies of enslavement, um, you know, can be seen in conflicts uh, within uh, the community, um, and this is uh, a part of the story, which is um, basically looking at um, internal conflicts in uh, uh, communities in London. Um, Behind this, there is uh, a multiplicity of layers. So we have uh, the memories of Zumbi um, and his fight for uh, freedom uh, as they are recounted by storytellers. <clears throat> and then um, uh, a number of uh, actions um, that have been taken by uh, activists, uh, political activists, as well as artists of African descent in various parts of the world and um, to counteract uh, the violence. And I would stop here. You have at least an understanding of, you know, the, the, the mise-en-scene. You have an understanding of the production. You also have an understanding of the quality of the video, um, which was shot, obviously, in 1995. Uh, for documentation purposes rather than um, for um, screening. And so this is something also to consider uh, when we look at the uh, dissemination of this material uh, online.